Hi everyone and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today we're going to be talking about signal transduction, getting your message across. Before we do that, I just want to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It's been a year since I started doing the Penguin Prof channel. I want to thank everybody for watching, for all your comments. It's been awesome. We had cake. Um, to celebrate, I decided to redo my very first video on signal transduction because looking back at it, um, it's pretty bad. So here we go. Um, signal transduction is of course about communication, something that all of us have to do all the time and we have all of these devices that help us to communicate. Um, cells, just like people, we have a lot of goals and a lot of challenges when we communicate. And uh, signal transduction allows cells to actually meet all of these goals. When we think about how cells communicate with each other, um, cells nearby can communicate um, through gap junctions, um, they can also communicate through paracrine secretions, but what about long distance communication? Um, for long distances we've got things like hormones, so here's an endocrine cell secreting a hormone into the blood, and you might be thinking about, you know, these are just molecules that travel all over the body, and how is it that some cells respond to those hormones and other cells don't? Um, how do cells actually change their sensitivity to the hormone over time? And why is it that some hormones cause one effect in one type of cell, but a completely different effect in another type of cell? Um, these all have to do with signal transduction, which we're going to talk about today. Um, other types of long-distance communication, of course, we have neurons. These guys would be the neurotransmitters. And then we have neurons that actually produce molecules that travel throughout the blood. We call these um, neurohormones. So um, all of these things involve the concept of, of signal transduction, getting a message across a cell membrane, very much like at an airport where if you have a ticket, you can cross that point. Um, if you don't, you got to stay on this uh, outside here. So if you think about it, like the cell membrane being the barrier, things that are lipophilic can cross. So in other words, we're going to divide all different types of signaling molecules into whether or not they are lipid-loving or lipid-fearing, because of course the cell membrane is made of lipids, right? So if you're made of lipids, you can cross. And lipophilic molecules will generally bind to receptors inside the cytoplasm or even inside the nucleus, and that's where they're going to um, actually cause the cell to transcribe certain genes. So if you're lipid loving, if you're lipophilic, you've got a ticket to cross the membrane. But what if you don't? What if you can't cross? So here's a ligand that can't cross the membrane because it is lipid fearing, it's lipophobic. It's going to need some kind of signal transduction mechanism as shown down here in order to get its message across. So here's this lipid fearing ligand and it's going to bind to a receptor. That receptor is going to change shape and it's going to cause some kind of cellular response. So let's look at an example of that. Um, this is a tyrosine kinase uh, complex. This is the extracellular side. This is the cell membrane. This is the barrier for the ligand because this ligand, this little guy cannot cross. So it's going to have to have some kind of signal transduction in order to get its message to the intracellular side. Okay, that's the goal. So here's the ligand binding to the receptor and when it binds it causes this whole thing to change shape and it activates the tyrosine kinase enzyme. So what tyrosine kinase does is it, here's the active side it actually binds a protein and ATP and it uses the energy from ATP and it also uses that phosphate that gets stripped off and it phosphorylates this protein and of course ADP would be left over and is released. Now when you see this phosphorylation I want you to get really excited because phosphorylation makes stuff happen. Okay, so anytime you see things being phosphorylated, it means that the cell is activating, doing something, making things, excreting things. It can move, it turns on ion channels, it gets excited, it sends a signal, it contracts, it catalyzes other reactions. Phosphorylation is a really big deal. So when you see that, I want you to realize that that is how the cell activates and does all kinds of things. So phosphorylation, makes stuff happen. 
So a slightly more complex type of signal transduction is shown here with a G protein and a denylyl cyclase complex. I know, right? The names are so sexy. Okay, don't panic when you see this. What we're going to look at is how the cell gets a big intracellular response from the binding of one ligand on the outside. So here we go step by step. Here's your ligand. Remember, this would be lipo phobic, right? It cannot cross the cell membrane. That's why all of this is necessary. It's going to bind to this receptor, and when it does, this receptor is going to change shape. I know this one actually looks kind of like a little snake here, but look at all these membrane-spanning regions. That's so cool. Here's your little G protein complex, and when the ligand binds, it's going to kind of the receptor kind of kicks out this third subunit of the G protein, which has a name, it's called the alpha subunit. And when that happens, when the alpha subunit dissociates, it's going to travel through the membrane and it's going to hit this adenylyl cyclase guy. Now this beast is an intramembrane um, amplifier enzyme. Okay, what that means is that it's an enzyme, it lives in the membrane, so it's anchored here, and its job is to make the second messenger cyclic AMP. Here's how it does that. It takes ATPs, and instead of pulling just one phosphate off of ATP to make ADP, which a lot of you are familiar with, it takes two phosphates off. Two phosphates removed from adenosine triphosphate leaves you with adenosine monophosphate, a phosphate, excuse me, that's what the M is for. The little C right here stands for cyclic. So in other words, it's a shape thing. So here's ATP, just like you're used to. In the presence of adenylyl cyclase, the enzyme, the, the terminal two phosphates get stripped off, leaving you with one, adenosine monophosphate. And see how it kind of looks like a little ring right here? That's where it gets the name cyclic AMP. Some people pronounce it C-A-M-P, and some people just call it CAMP. This is the second messenger. This is what appears in the membrane in huge quantities when that ligand binds to that receptor and activates the amplifier enzyme adenylyl cyclase. So what happens after that? It depends on the cell. Usually cyclic AMP will activate a kinase. And that kinase, of course, causes phosphorylation. And when you see phosphorylation, of course, you get very, very excited and you get a hugely amplified cellular response in response to that original ligand binding to the receptor. So that's how one ligand on the outside of the cell can cause a huge response on the inside. And hopefully you see why it's called an amplifier enzyme, right? Because one ligand gives you lots of stuff on the inside. There are other second messengers. Here are some. Actually, calcium can act as a second messenger. We're going to see that a lot when we talk about things like muscle contraction. Um, other nucleotides, so we just saw cyclic AMP. You can also have cyclic GMP. These guys are a little uglier. They're lipid-derived molecules, inositol triphosphate, diacylglycerol. Don't they have just fantastic names? I know you love them. But they all do basically the same thing. So as foreign as all of this might be, the more, uh, sig the more signal transduction uh, examples you look at, you're going to find out that they have a lot more in common uh, than you might think. And the reason why this is important is because we make a lot of drugs that interact with signal transduction mechanisms. Some drugs we produce are agonists. So an agonist is going to cause the same effect as the native ligand. So if this is the native ligand, we make a drug that acts just the same. It binds to the same receptor and it causes the same response. Also in the laboratory, we can make antagonists, and an antagonist is going to be a blocker. So it's going to be like a competitive inhibitor. It's going to sit right on the active site, excuse me, it's going to sit right on the binding site of this receptor, and it's going to prevent the ligand from binding. So it's going to stop the signal transduction mechanism from occurring. So hopefully by understanding different types of signal transduction pathways, when you have to learn about all the different pharmacological agents that are used, um, you won't have to memorize quite so much, right? So if you understand how a beta receptor works, then it makes sense what a beta blocker does. That's the idea. So I hope this was helpful. As always, thank you for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. I really enjoy all your feedback, and thanks for a fantastic year. I've got a lot more good stuff planned. So stay tuned. Thanks a lot.